It's time for the three question one for Biochem 3. Let's get going. Uh, for which organisms can the following antibiotic classes be used? We're looking at tetracyclines, macrolides, uh, second gen generation cephalosporin. So for the tetracyclines, we do have a mnemonic vacuum the bedroom. So that's going to include Vibrio cholera, acne, uh, chlamydia, uroplasma, uro urolyticum, uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae, tularemia, H. pylori. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, which causes Lyme disease, and uh, Rickettsia rickettsii, uh, which causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. For the macrolides, the mnemonic is PUS, P U S, P for pneumonia, uh, especially for your atypical pneumonia, which include Legionella pneumophilia, Mycoplasma pneumonia, and Chlamydia pneumoniae. U is for URI, so specifically with that group A strep causing strep throat. And then S uh, was for the STDs like gonorrhea and chlamydia. Second generation cephalosporins, a mnemonic that we used was HINPEX. Uh, so that's going to be H flu, Enterobacter, Neisseria, uh, the P is for Proteus mirabilis, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Serratia. And then don't forget the gram positive cocci, which are also covered by these second generation cephalosporins as well. Next question. A 25 year old pregnant woman in her third trimester has a normal BP when standing and sitting. When supine, uh, her BP drops to 90 over 50. What is the diagnosis? So, this is actually just compression of the inferior vena cava. Uh, so, as a woman lies supine during uh, her third uh, trimester, the uterus compresses the inferior vena cava, uh, which is why you're supposed to lie on your left or right. Uh, there's less preload going to the heart, so there's less stroke volume coming out of the heart, and then that's why that blood pressure drops. Next question, what drugs can be used to reverse neuromuscular blockade? So these are the cholinesterase inhibitors. So neostigmine is the prototype drug that's used for this. Uh, remember that it's only for neuromuscular blockade with non-depolarizing drugs like tubocurarine or vecuronium. That's it for the warm up. Let's get that lecture now. We've been talking about DNA, and in this video we're going to talk about DNA's redheaded stepchild, RNA. Now the whole purpose of DNA is to encode proteins, and you can't do that without RNA. Now, there are several subtypes of RNA, which I'll just mention briefly as we get started. There's messenger RNA, or mRNA, which is the RNA copied from the DNA template, the one that's translated into proteins. So that's the largest type of RNA. There's tRNA, or transfer RNA, which matches up to mRNA and brings in the amino acids. So it transfers the information from the mRNA to the polypeptide chain. And these tRNAs are the smallest type of RNA. And there's rRNA, or ribosomal RNA, which we're going to talk about more in the next video on protein synthesis. But rRNA is part of the ribosome, and it's actually what binds the amino acids together. And because it's part of the ribosome, you know it has to be the most abundant type of RNA, because think of how many ribosomes a single cell has. Hundreds, maybe thousands. So rRNA is the most abundant. And while we're doing this alphabet soup, there's also hnRNA, which is heterogeneous nuclear RNA. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, the one other thing that's worth writing down is where these different RNA molecules are synthesized. mRNA and tRNA are synthesized in the nucleoplasm, the liquid portion of the nucleus. But rRNA is synthesized in the nucleolus, and that's important to know. We mentioned earlier that RNA codes for specific amino acids using codons. Uh, codons are a sequence of three nucleotides, or three bases. And the first mRNA codon to be translated into a polypeptide is always AUG, and that's called the start codon. Now in eukaryotes, that AUG start codon codes for methionine. And in prokaryotes, it's formal methionine. So your first amino acid in a new polypeptide is always going to be methionine, although often those ends are going to be clipped off during post-translational processing. You also need to know the mRNA stop codons. Now, students have actually reported that they are asked about this on step one, so make sure you know them. There are three different stop codons, UGA, UAA, and UAG. So any one of those codons tells the ribosome and the rest of the protein translation machinery that the complete polypeptide sequence has been translated. You can stop translation. And remember, if you accidentally mutate the DNA so that it makes one of those stop codons, the translation is going to stop early, and we call that a nonsense mutation. Before we can start making polypeptides, we have to transcribe the DNA into mRNA. And transcription is a very highly regulated process. Your body needs to be able to control which genes are expressed when and in what tissues. For instance, all of your cells contain the genetic code for insulin. But only certain cells in the pancreas actually transcribe that gene and translate it into insulin. So regulation of transcription is very important. So let's talk about how our cells decide which genes are going to be transcribed. The first transcription regulator I want to discuss is a segment of DNA called an operon. Let's look at number four in your study guide. 
An operon is a segment of DNA made up of genes that are transcribed, and that's the coding region, plus the promoter region, plus all the various regulatory regions before that coding region, like uh, enhancers and repressors. So lots and lots of your DNA isn't actually genes that encode proteins. There are lots of important pieces of DNA that function only to regulate transcription of the genes. So we're going to talk more about how operons work in a moment. Transcription factors. Now these aren't part of your DNA. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to the promoter region and that allows transcription to take place. So no transcription factor, no DNA transcription. No promoter region, no transcription. The promoter regions include the, the cat box, the tata box, and the primnow box. So the cat box is a sequence of DNA, about 75 nucleotides upstream from the start site, and it has the sequence CCAAT. The tata box is about 25 nucleotides upstream, and it has the sequence TATA followed by a bunch more A's. And then the primnow box is another sequence. It's about 10 nucleotides upstream, and it also contains the TATA -T -A plus AT. So it's TATA -T -A AT. But all three of those regions are promoters, little areas of DNA where the transcription factors can bind. And again, the transcription factor has to bind the promoter. No transcription factor, no transcription. And obviously, if you have a mutation in one of those promoter regions, that's generally going to result in a substantial decrease in the amount of mRNA that gets transcribed. Now, let's look at the operator region. The operator region is another segment of DNA that binds to proteins to help regulate gene expression. It can either bind to repressor proteins to stop transcription, or it can bind to an inducer protein to start transcription. And the operator region is typically located somewhere between the promoter region and the start site. So not only do you need transcription factors bound to the promoter region to start transcription, but you might also need an inducer protein to start transcription, or the absence of a repressor protein. If the repressor protein is bound to that operator region, that's going to prevent transcription. And the next bullet is response elements. So response elements include enhancer regions and repressor regions. Now this isn't the repressor protein, this is a repressor region, which is a region of DNA. These response elements don't determine whether or not the transcription takes place at all, like the promoter region and the operator region. All those other regions we've been talking about are like an on-off switch that determines whether the gene's going to be transcribed at all. These response elements determine how quickly transcription takes place. They're either going to increase or decrease the rate of transcription when they're bound by various protein factors. And unlike the promoter regions, which are always upstream, and unlike the operator region, which is upstream, the location of the enhancer or repressor region can be close to or far from or even within the promoter region. They can be found upstream, they can be found downstream, they can be inside the intron of a gene. They can even sometimes be found on a totally separate chromosome, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around. So the location of an enhancer or a repressor can be almost anywhere. So to summarize, there are regulators that are required for transcription to start, like transcription factors binding to the promoter region, or inducer proteins binding to the operator region. There are regulators that might prevent transcription from taking place, such as a repressor protein binding to an operator region. There are regulators that are going to increase the rate of transcription, like a protein binding to an enhancer region. And there are regulators that decrease the rate of transcription, like a protein binding to a repressor region. And then our last bullet talks about some structural motifs in these proteins that allow the proteins to physically interact with the DNA. So we list the helix loop helix, and the helix turn helix, and so on. So let's turn to number five and take a look at some of these. One structural motif that allows proteins to interact with DNA is called a helix loop helix. So this shape allows the protein to incorporate into the major groove of the DNA double helix. The next one is the helix turn helix, which is another unique structure that allows the protein to interact with DNA. Another one is a zinc finger motif, which incorporates very well into DNA. And its claim to fame is the fact that it has a zinc on it, so it's pretty easy to identify. And the fourth structural motif you need to know has lots of leucine residues on it, so it's referred to as the leucine zipper protein. Now let's look at how all these different transcription regulators work together by reviewing the LAC operon, which is number six in your study guide. Now this might be something you studied in undergrad, maybe not so much in medical school, but the LAC operon is a great example of how repressors and transcription factors can determine whether or not a gene is transcribed. Not only that, LAC operon has also been known to turn up on step one, which is why we're going to talk about it. So first of all, the LAC operon has to do with metabolizing lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide sugar, and in order to digest lactose, bacteria have to be able to break it down into glucose and galactose. And the prokaryotic enzyme that does this is called beta-galactosidase. Now, because lactose has to be broken down, it's easier for bacteria to digest glucose than lactose. 
and it would be a waste of energy to make beta-galactosidase if there was no lactose around or if the easier to digest glucose was around. So the purpose of these repressor regions and transcription factors in the lac operon is to regulate the transcription of this beta-galactosidase enzyme. So there's a transcription factor called CAP, or catabolite activating protein, which basically determines whether or not this gene sequence is transcribed. Again, it's a transcription factor. So you have to have CAP around in order for transcription to take place. And CAP is only around when glucose is not around. So we have four possible scenarios. In the first two scenarios, there's plenty of glucose. And that means CAP is not around, which means that the operon is turned off. In the third scenario, there's no glucose. So CAP is bound, which means you're ready to transcribe. But you can't transcribe whenever there's a repressor protein bound to the operator region. And this repressor protein is always bound unless lactose is present. There's a lactose metabolite called allolactose that binds to the repressor protein and changes its shape. And that changed shape prevents the repressor protein from binding to the DNA. So when lactose is present, the repressor protein gets removed. So that's what's happening in the fourth scenario. Lactose is present, so the repressor protein has been removed. And since glucose is absent, that means CAP is bound. And that's the only one of these four scenarios that will allow transcription to take place. So it's really not very complicated. Again, it's just an example of how transcription factors and repressors interact with one another in certain scenarios to regulate whether transcription takes place. Now let's talk about RNA polymerases. We talked about how transcription is regulated. So let's assume now that you're ready to transcribe. You have all your transcription factors bound where they need to be bound, and there aren't any repressors in the way, so you're ready to transcribe. The enzyme that transcribes the DNA template into an mRNA molecule is called RNA polymerase. Now, eukaryotes have three different RNA polymerases. RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. RNA polymerase 1 makes rRNA. RNA polymerase 2 makes mRNA. And RNA polymerase 3 makes tRNA. And then there's a mushroom toxin called alpha amanitin that inhibits RNA polymerase 2. So ingestion of this toxin can cause hepatotoxicity and possibly some liver failure. Now, what about prokaryotes? Prokaryotes don't have three different RNA polymerases. They're, they're more efficient. They're more streamlined. They don't have the resources to spend energy on stuff like that. So prokaryotes have just a single RNA polymerase that makes all three kinds of RNA. And do you remember what antibiotic inhibits prokaryotic RNA polymerase? It's rifampin. Remember the four R's of rifampin. R for rifampin uh, in inhibits RNA polymerase red secretions, like red tears, red sweat, red urine, and R4 revs up the cytochrome P450. So rifampin induces cytochrome P450. All right, now we've regulated transcription. We finally started transcription with one of the polymerases. How do we terminate transcription? Now, in eukaryotes, we don't really fully understand how termination of transcription takes place, but we do have a pretty good idea of what takes place in prokaryotes. So this is number seven in your study guide. There are two ways that prokaryotes terminate transcription. The first is the Rho factor. The Rho factor is an RNA-dependent ATPase that's found in E. coli. Rho factor uses the energy found in ATP to knock RNA polymerase off of that DNA template. That's pretty easy enough. Uh, you know, if you throw enough energy at something, you can make things happen. The other mechanism is a Rho-independent mechanism. So this is where you have a region of DNA that's rich in guanine and cytosine, and that's followed by a region that's rich in uracil. Now, remember, Guanine binds to cytosine using three hydrogen bonds, right? So it's a relatively stronger bond. So this GC-rich region is transcribed into RNA, and as that RNA is transcribed, the Gs and Cs on the same strand of RNA are going to start pairing with each other. And this single-stranded RNA is going to start folding and binding to itself, and it makes very strong hydrogen bonds. And the RNA forms a, a stem loop structure with sort of a hairpin appearance. And that hairpin structure puts tension on the RNA polymerase. And as that pressure is transmitted to the uracil-rich part of the RNA, the RNA breaks off at that point because those uracil adenine bonds only have two hydrogen bonds. It's relatively weaker. So again, the hairpin puts pressure on the polymerase and puts pressure on this uracil-rich piece of RNA. And then the whole complex, whole complex kind of breaks apart. So we've transcribed RNA and we've terminated transcription. So that raw, unprocessed, newly transcribed, hot off the press RNA is called heterogeneous nuclear RNA or HNRNA. It's not actually mRNA yet. It has to be processed first. So remember, the nucleus is a very tightly regulated place. 
there are nuclear pores in the nuclear membrane and only certain things are allowed to move in and out through those nuclear pores. So in order for RNA to leave the nucleus, it has to be processed. To make mRNA from your hnRNA, you have to do three things. You have to put a cap on the five prime end, you have to polyadenylate the three prime end, and you have to remove the introns. Only the RNA that's processed in these three ways can be transported out of the nucleus. So the five prime cap is a seven methyl guanosine molecule that gets tacked onto the five prime end of the RNA. This seven methyl guanosine cap is provided by a critical molecule called SAM, or S adenosyl methionine. And we're going to talk about SAM briefly in another video. Polyadenylation of the three prime end means that you're adding a huge string of adenines onto the three prime end, something like 200 or 250 adenines in a row. There's an enzyme called poly-A polymerase that creates this poly-A tail without needing a DNA template. But there is a specific signal that gets it started, which is double A U triple A. So it's A A U A A A. And the third way that RNA has to be processed before it's a mature mRNA molecule that can leave the nucleus is the splicing out of introns. Remember, not all of the DNA sequence codes for proteins. Besides the promoter regions and operator regions that are never transcribed, there are also RNA sequences that are transcribed that aren't really part of the protein coding. And those extra pieces are called introns. Well, obviously, before you go translating this mRNA, you have to get rid of those introns. In eukaryotes, there's something called a spliceosome that's responsible for nicking the RNA, pulling out the introns, and then gluing the RNA back together. So spliceosomes splice out the introns. Remember, the introns are intervening uh, RNA sequences that stay in the nucleus. So the introns stay in the nucleus after they're pulled out of the sequence. And then the exons exit the nucleus and eventually get expressed as proteins. So the final product is a mature mRNA molecule that's able to leave the nucleus through the nuclear pores and go out to the ribosomes and be translated into a protein. We're going to talk about protein translation in the next video. But for now, let's go over the end of session quiz. First question, what amino acid frequently has more coding sequences in the mRNA than are represented in the peptide that's created from that mRNA? The answer is methionine. So remember, there's going to be more AUG codons in the mRNA than there's actual methionine in the final protein because AUG is the start sequence, the start codon, and that initial methionine is commonly going to be cleaved off. Next, what's the difference between an intron and an exon? So introns are non-coding segments of DNA. Exons are the coding sequences for specific protein products. And the last question, how is transcription of the LAC operon regulated? So transcription of the LAC operon is regulated by two things, CAP, or catabolite activating protein, and the LAC repressor. So CAP allows RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA and begin uh, transcription of the beta-galactosidase gene. So you have to have the CAP in order to transcribe the gene. But remember, CAP will not bind to the DNA if glucose is present. So you need CAP, but if glucose is around, there's no CAP. And then the LAC repressor protein prevents RNA polymerase from binding to the DNA. So it inhibits transcription. It's a repressor. And it also, therefore, is going to inhibit uh, production of beta-galactosidase. And the LAC repressor is constitutively bound to the LAC operator region unless lactose is present. So the LAC operon is only switched on when glucose is absent and lactose is present. So that's it for the end of session quiz. I'll see you next time.